good afternoon, Professor Pang and colleagues at Chang'eng Memorial Hospital in Taipei. It's uh, Adiba Kamaru Zaman here from University of Malaya Medical Center in Kuala Lumpur. And my colleagues, uh, Professor Sharida, Sharifa Farida on my right, infectious diseases, and uh, Professor Sashila Vana, also an infectious disease specialist, on my left. Join so thank you very much for agreeing to do this webinar with us. I know it's taken us some time to actually uh, come to this point, um, but we've all been uh, very, very excited to, to have this webinar with you because, um, as we know, uh, Taiwan has been uh, one of the most successful countries in terms of containing uh, the epidemic or the pandemic of COVID right from the very beginning. And um, although here, we here in Malaysia have done not too badly, um, uh, in fact, uh, our whole region, I think we can be proud of uh, compared to many other regions of the world um, has done very well. Um, nevertheless, uh, we felt that there is much that we can learn from you um, and how, uh, what, what uh, steps that you had taken um, and continue to take, uh, because I think the one thing we know about COVID, that there's a lot of things we still don't know about SARS-CoV-2, but the one thing that we know is we need to remain vigilant um, and assume that it's going to be with us uh, for a very long time. So uh, I know here in Malaysia, although we feel that uh, we've been successful in containing it, um, for the most part, uh, uh, many of us, at least many of us in infectious disease and also in public health, um, feel that all those measures that have been taken um, we'll need to continue for a very long time, perhaps uh, uh, to try and avoid another severe lockdown like what we had uh, for the month of March and April. So uh, the objective of this uh, webinar was really to uh, learn from the experts in Taiwan, um, like I said, on how you manage uh, the, the pandemic and how you are continuing to manage to ensure that your numbers uh, remain low to zero. So with that, maybe I can hand over to Prof Pang uh, for some welcoming words. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, uh, Professor Abiba and, and colleagues, dear colleagues in Malaysia. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, it's really our uh, pleasure and, and, and very exciting moment that uh, uh, during this uh, pandemic uh, time, we can still meet together through the uh, to website, uh, internet, and we can have this web seminar. And uh, it's really uh, uh, important for us to to come together and uh, facing this uh, great challenge. And as far as I, I know, this is a uh, in my lifetime, it's, it's really a, a, a big uh, uh, challenge. So I'm, I'm very glad that uh, I have a few colleagues with me today. Uh, uh, I would like to introduce them to you. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to introduce our professor, uh, uh, Chiu. Uh, he's uh, now our vice superintendent on my left. And actually, he's the real person, who, our real hero. Uh, he's the uh, COVID-19 Task Force Committee Chairman uh, that, uh, that uh, help us to uh, overcome this uh, this uh, challenge. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, Professor Cho uh, will have some uh, uh, clinical duty. But uh, before he left, uh, I would like him to give a few words. Uh, now, uh, on my right side, I have uh, Professor Liu. Uh, he's uh, uh, probably uh, Adiba. Uh, Professor Adiba know him well. Uh, Professor Liu is a thoracic surgeon, and I'm, I'm happy that he he's joining us uh, in this meeting. And on my right, right side, we have our uh, director of uh, thoracic department, uh, medicine department, and he also uh, a critical care uh, physician. So uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lin Su Ming, uh, Dr. Lim uh, also our 
our hero here. I mean, he helping us to uh, take care of a few uh, critical patients. And also, I have a doctor Zhen Yuwen. He's a physician from the infection control department, and he's the infection specialist. And he also the uh, co-chairman of our infection control community uh, in Taoyuan uh, Changgen. So uh, I'm very happy that we can come together and, and uh, have some uh, experience sharing. So before I, I hand over to uh, back to Professor Adiba, I would like our uh, chairman of this uh, COVID-19 task force, Professor Chu, can you speak a few words? Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pen. Uh, Dr. Adiba? Professor Adiva, you can hear me? Very nicely, very loud and clear. Thank you. Yes, okay. Good afternoon, Professor Adiva and, and our uh, colleagues here. Yeah, like Professor Adiva said, it's not easy for us to get, it, to get to this point to have this meeting. I think this meeting is very important. We can uh, commun communicate with each other our experience uh, in dealing with the COVID-19 in the past five. And also we learn from, we can learn from each other. And, you know, in Taiwan, we, uh, we manage to control this uh, uh, pandemic, epidemic uh, uh, quite well. So far, we, in Taiwan, we have only, uh, have only treated about 480 cases. And, but despite that, you know, the uh, epidemic, the pandemic still, you know, very severe in our neighboring countries. So we still keep high vigilance to the possible resurgence of the infection in our country. And so uh, in Sanger Memorial Hospital, we, you know, Sanger Memorial Hospital is a big hospital. We have to uh, do... Uh, Good preparedness for the, uh, the possible uh, comeback of the infection. So today, um, I would like to give a short, uh, uh, brief uh, introduction of the two talks that will be given uh, by my colleagues, sharing with you our uh, previous experience in in uh, dealing with the first wave of the infection in the past several months. And Dr. Chen. Who is, um, who is my colleague in Division of Infectious Disease, will talk to you about the preparedness um, for COVID-19 uh, in our hospital, and also our response to some uh, clusters of the infection in the community as well as in the hospital. And also Dr. Lin, who is the head of the uh, Department of uh, Thoracic Medicine, will give a, a short a talk on um, our management of severe COVID-19 in our hospital. Actually, although not too many, but patients, uh, you know, treated in our hospital are very severe, were very severe. So I think Dr. Lim will share with you some of our very, some of our very precious uh, experience in, in treating those severe patients. And hopefully uh, through this uh, communication, we can, uh, you know, be uh, prepared for the next wave of the uh, COVID-19 in the near, in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Chu, for your uh, uh, introduction. And now, uh, maybe we will move on to the uh, our our next speaker. Uh, I think we, I would like uh, uh, Professor Chen to give us the uh, preparedness and infection control measurement in Changgen. Uh, oh, we try to share the the slide again. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, um, the major purpose of our hospital infection control measure is to prevent our staff and our patient from nosocomial infection and to preserve the operation of our healthcare system. So um, our infection control measure have to stop the major two routes of viral circulation. The first one is to prevent the transmission of virus from community into the hospital. And the second is to prevent the viral circulation in the hospital. So, 
So in the first part, we try to prevent the viral transmission from community. We uh, implement a two strategy. The first, I think is the most important is we call the patient traffic control and the risk stratification. And the second is the, about the visitor restriction. The patient traffic control bundling and the risk stratification is uh, made the core element of our infection control policy. The first part about this traffic control is an triage at every entrance of the hospital. And the second part is about the strict separation among zones of risk for the inpatients. So during this pandemic, we uh, check the body temperature for every visitors, every patients uh, at the entrance of our hospital. So you check the body temperature, we check their immigration data by reading our, uh, their health insurance card. And we ask about their respiratory symptom and their contact cluster or occupation history. So if any visitors or patients, they have fever or any respiratory symptom or any relevant travel history, they will not be allowed to enter the hospital. We will direct them to our epidemic clinic or our ER outdoor quarantine station according to the severity of their symptoms. Our epidemic clinic and the ER outdoor quarantine station, these are all independent areas. They have independent entrance, independent air conditioning. So this triage can prevent the symptomatic patients having contact with other patients. So the second part about this traffic control is the uh, strict separation among zones of risk. This is for the inpatient. For example, uh, if any patient, uh, he had pneumonia, uh, is, is diagnosed at the ER quarantine station or the epidemic clinic, he needs hospitalization for further treatment. We will uh, evaluate their risk for COVID-19. If this patient, uh, he meets the criteria of Taiwan CDC's definition for COVID-19, we will admit it, transfer them to the isolation ward. The isolation ward were all negative pressure room. And he will receive the PCR test for the SARS-CoV immediately. If they have, uh, they did not meet the criteria of our uh, CDC's definition, uh, maybe he has some atypical presentation, we will transfer them to our quarantine ward. The quarantine ward is all single room. And patients in the quarantine ward will also receive the PCR test for SARS-CoV-2 and some empiric antibiotic treatment. So um, patients in the isolation ward or the quarantine ward, they can be transferred to the general ward, we call the green, green zone, if their PCR tests were all negative. Or their, or their COVID-19 can be excluded by the clinical treatment response. They can be transferred to the green world. So uh, this is a one-way process. Also to prevent the symptomatic patients having contact with other patients in our hospital. And every healthcare workers, uh, they work in the red zone or in the yellow zone, they all where the standard personal protective equipment, including the N95 respirators. And um, the second part about to prevent the outbreak in hospital is we have to set up a standard protocol for the personal protective equipment. So this is the uh, recommendation for PPEs by Taiwan CDC. And uh, the staff, he work in the high risk area. For example, in the epidemic clinic or in the red zone or yellow zone, and he may have some uh, risk of blood, body fluid or respiratory specimen contact. He have to wear the standard protective equipment. But those working in the, at the low risk area, they only have to wear a surgical mask. 
Yes. So every staff in our hospital have to follow the recommendations of PBE. Uh, sorry, I don't have anything, but somebody brought some food, so Elaine sent her regards, and then she say. Uh, to congratulate your your papa, I mean your like oh. yesterday. Right. So let's go out for another <laughs> round of makan makan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is the one. This is the Okay. So um, our traffic control bundling at the entrance can uh, evaluate the symptomatic patient, uh, screen the symptomatic patient, but. Uh, we know that in the early stage of COVID-19 infection, some patient, most of the patients are asymptomatic, or we call the pre-symptomatic. So maybe they develop their symptoms after in entering our hospital. So for every inpatient have pneumonia, we have to evaluate immediately. So we set up uh, an expert team, and we have a fever screen policy to evaluate all inpatient with pneumonia. So our hospital have a real-time fever monitoring system. So our ID physician can use this IT assisted uh, tool to uh, active screen for every patient in our hospital, every fever patient in our hospital. And um, if any inpatient, he developed pneumonia, and the physician can contact the responsible ID physician immediately. And we also have an expert team. Uh, we have a pulmonologist ID physician. Uh, we, have, we will discuss about the, the patient's condition. If he had any risk of COVID-19, we, have, we uh, will test for the PCR test immediately. And the third, third method to prevent outbreak in hospital is the checkpoint hand disinfection. We know uh, that the fomite transmission is also a very important route of viral transmission. So we widely set up our uh, alcohol sanitizers in every entrance, every checkpoint uh, in our hospital to encourage hand hygiene. And the fourth is about the subdivision of our clinical teams. During this pandemic, uh, so every, basically every our clinical units, uh, we divided the staff in every clinical unit to different groups. So every group, they work at different area and use different offices. And to prevent unnecessary prolonged contact between these groups. And the purpose of, uh, of this subdivision is to avoid the isolation or quarantine for most of the healthcare workers, if one of them get infected. To do this subdivision, we have to lower down to reduce our clinical service. Our surgeon uh, canceled or postponed some non-urgent surgery, and we lower down our outpatient and inpatient services, about 20 to 30%. So um, subdivision of clinical teams, we also encourage the social distancing in hospital. So we keep about six meets, six feet, sorry, six feet uh, safe distance in, in hospital, in the conference room, in the restroom. And the final part uh, is about the uh, education and the staff health surveillance. We ask our staff to report their body temperature or respiratory symptoms every day. They can report it through our health surveillance apps or through the hospital information system. So if any, any staff, he have fever or a respiratory symptom or flu-like symptom, we will ask him to stop work and receive the test for COVID-19. And he or she can return to back, come back to work if he had the COVID-19 test was negative and he or she was a febrile for over 24 hours. So, so they can uh, back to work. And this is the summary and the timeline of our infection control measures implemented during this pandemic. In the background, the blue bar is the daily COVID-19 confirmed cases in Taiwan. The first COVID-19 case diagnosed in our hospital is uh, in February 20. It's an inpatient, 
the COVID-19 was diagnosed about one week after admission. And one week later, we have second inpatient. It was diagnosed COVID-19. And we have a small outbreak. There are four of our healthcare workers were get infected after contacting these patients. So from this point, we started a more strict visitor restriction. Um, we started with our an outdoor pharmacy and to prevent the viral influx from the community. We also reinforce our uh, patient traffic control and the inpatient uh, pneumonia surveillance. So after the reinforcement of these policies, um, in the pandemic era, in the March and April, all of the uh, positive cases diagnosed in our hospital were all diagnosed at the ER quarantine station. There are no more inpatient and no more healthcare worker being infected uh, by COVID-19. So um, this is the summary about our hospital's infection control measures for this pandemic. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Chen, for your sharing. Now I will hand uh, our presenter back to uh, University of Malaya, uh, Professor Adiba, please. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Bang and, and, and Dr. Cheng. That was uh, uh, a really, really uh, nice presentation of the steps that you took um, to prevent hospital transmission and, and your infection control and hospital preparedness. Um, uh, over here, we, we, um, I, I'll open the floor to any questions. I myself have a couple of questions um, from your presentation, but perhaps I'll uh, give the floor to anyone else who might uh, want to ask. Please uh, indicate um, in the chat group and I'll call you up or you can unmute yourselves. If not, maybe I can lead off. Uh, Dr. Cheng, we, we're all uh, quite amazed by the temperature chart yeah. that you showed of your patients. Can you explain that uh, a little bit? D do you mean that every patient's uh, yeah. uh, recording is available to, to, to the team electronically? Every staff, no pressure. Hey, excuse me. Can you repeat the question? Thank you. Okay. You showed us that, you know, of every patient that you can then um, uh, react to if you're concerned that they may be having uh, COVID infection. It, does that mean that every patient's chart, someone is monitoring in the hospital other than the primary doctors? Um, uh, for for pa inpatients, we have uh, about 20 ID physicians in our hospital. So every ID physician has his or her responsible area. So uh, he or, or she can monitor uh, the fever patient in his area through this fever dashboard. And for our staff, uh, we ask our staff to report their body temperature uh, every day. So for now, um, the percentage of our health our staff reporting percentage is about 95%. So most of the staff will report their temperature or symptoms through these this, uh, um, apps. Yes. Okay, so um, we have a similar thing with staff, but I'm, I'm just intrigued by the monitoring by your ID physicians. First of all, you have twice the number of ID physicians that we have. Um, so does this mean that the ID physicians will also monitor, say, if the area happens to be orthopedics, patients uh, in the orthopedic unit, that they will monitor those patients as well? Is that, is that how it works? Yes, yes. And the orthopedic yeah. doctors are willing to let <laughs> ID physicians uh, kind of uh, monitor their patients? So um, we basically, uh, we screen for the fever patients. So for example, if any uh, fever patient in the orthopedic ward and the responsible ID 
still can evaluate, uh, for example, about his chest image and symptoms on the medical record. If uh, the ID uh, evaluation, uh, if the patient have presentation or any risk of COVID-19, we will contact the, his responsible uh, orthopedist. Yes. Hey, well, that's, uh, that's an amazing level of, of monitoring. We thought we were doing well, but yeah, I, I guess that's uh, how you've really managed to um, contain it. Shashia, do you have a question? I, another thing that caught my eye was um, in that graph, in that uh, epi sort of curve that you showed, um, you started wearing masks in the hospital as early as January, is that correct? Um, I think it starts from the late of January, as about January 20 or, or 30, yes. And also this is uh, our national policy. It's our CDC ask every uh, staff or every patient to wear surgical mask in the hospital since January. Right, so that was, uh, you know, for the rest of the world, we ourselves only made that uh, compulsory in our hospital in March, but uh, for Malaysia, it's still not compulsory, although there is a pretty high level of uh, adherence to mask wearing, but as you know, the rest of the world, um, they don't wear masks uh, in the community, much less in the hospital, yeah, for, for the public. So that's... that's um, quite something that you instituted that very, very early in January, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. We'll probably have more questions later, but um, we'll move on to um, the sharing of what we did here at UMMC in terms of preparedness and infection control. And to do that, um, I invite Associate Professor Dr. Sashila to share with you our experience here in KL. Thank you very much, Prof. Adiba. And it's very nice to see you again, uh, Professor Pang, and everyone else. Um, though we can't see face to face, at least a webinar is good. And it was a great presentation. Uh, we too faced a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, in our hospital, uh, in the initial phase, uh, you know, due to um, lack of knowing what to do because of the way the disease was uh, being transmitted. Uh, so I, I shall uh, start my presentation. So uh, the contents will be a bit about the epidemiology, the steps we took during the heights of the pandemic, and subsequently uh, what we uh, are doing now and still learning in the process. So the epic, this is more or less the epic curve of, uh, of uh, the cases in Malaysia. Our first case was on the 21st of January. It was an uh, uh, imported case. And subsequently, uh, we started seeing clusters uh, of cases in uh, our country uh, in, in March, early March onwards. And uh, we started our MCO 18th of March, but during that time, we already had about 600 cases. Uh, as you can see, this is how the progression was. We went to movement control order, then enhanced movement control order, uh, and um, uh, control movement order. And now we are recovery movement order, and uh, we are slowly opening up. Um, and most of our cases were actually clusters of cases. We had more than 60 clusters uh, so far, and some are still going on. So we had religious gathering clusters. We had construction site clusters. We had uh, UK clusters, returning students clusters. Uh, currently, we're having a Russian cluster. Uh, in fact, we had uh, a few clusters within the hospitals due to uh, staff transmitting to each other, though we never really had um, uh, patient uh, who were COVID in a COVID ward, uh, you know, if, if they were already known, we, we didn't have transmission. So uh, there were a lot of challenges initially. 
So as of now, uh, or yesterday, we have had 8,729 cases and four new cases. And these four new cases, out of them, three of them are imported and come from the Russian cluster. Uh, we have had uh, 122 deaths, which is about 1.39%. And if you can see here, um, most of the uh, cases were within uh, Klang Valley, Kuala Lumpur, Slango, uh, which is where University Hospital is mainly in, where, where the main bulk of the cases were. So this is University of Malaya, just quickly, we're at tertiary, tertiary teaching hospitals, a hospital which is about 1,600 bed with about 8,000 over staff serving a big population of patients within one of the, uh, I would say, the um, big areas of COVID. And uh, in our hospital, uh, the total number of uh, cases uh, that we that were positive was 148. Uh, uh, we had a big number of PUIs coming to us, and we had six deaths, mainly from an el elderly group of patients. Uh, and um, we do not ha we have not had any cases since uh, sorry this since um, end of May. So this is more or less our our curve. Um, our first case was on the 26th of February. It was an imported case. So what we did initially when, when uh, we formed the task force, this was our initial period, what we did. So when we heard about the, um, of, of the cases coming, you know, being uh, announced by WHO and different websites, we had our first uh, task force me uh, meeting, a committee meeting to 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 address this issue uh, as early as uh, 6th of January. And then uh, mid, uh, on the 23rd of January, the, the government or Ministry of Health had designated our hospital as one of the referral hospitals of COVID. And then we officially formed a task force consisting of multidisciplinary teams. So there were surgeons, radiologists, anesthetists, infection control and preventionists, uh, our occupational safety doctors, uh, social and preventive medicine, uh, even uh, the information technology group. So we, we had representative from, from every department uh, to make sure that everything was covered. We restructured the wards and services. I think very similar to what, what you all did. Uh, but uh, So first we, we came up with a, with a guideline. So uh, Ministry of Health came up with a guideline on the 16th and we kind of adapted it to our hospital. Uh, and then we had uh, education and awareness and PPE training for all staff. So, you know, since it was a new disease, we had, uh, we, we quickly formed a, a team, which is uh, uh, formed by the education team, because being a university hospital, we had a team that in, was in charge of educating students and healthcare workers. So we came up with uh, quick modules to educate the clinical as well as non-clinical staff. And the clinical staff were taught or retrained to use the PPEs, especially doffing. And as you know, the guidelines change very fast. So on how to use uh, uh, the, the N95 masks and their, their gowns and doffing them properly. We also zoned the, the hospital to COVID and non-COVID wards and also uh, put in engineering controls because uh, we, um, not all areas were, were suited to, to take care of respiratory diseases, especially airborne ones. So in our ED, we had to put up plastic barriers, we had to put up HEPA filters, and we had to rezone our emergency department as well as our wards to, to avoid or separating COVID patients from non-COVID patients. We also gazetted COVID, ward, uh, COVID and acute respiratory infection wards and areas so, so that uh, areas in the ward as well as in the emergency department uh, this is so that uh, just like what you all did in your area, the patients in ED were immediately, uh, if they had respiratory symptoms, they were immediately cohorted uh, or put in an isolation room and uh, screened. Uh, and also one of the important things uh, to contain the disease was early identification and source control. So we had very strict entry points check. We came up with an online um, screen or say, entry visa. So for healthcare workers, everyone had to do this daily. Initially, it was in a paper form. Then we changed it to an online form. Uh, we have for non-UMN um, non, uh, because it's complex as well, students, patients and accompanying uh, people. Everyone had to fill up this form. And again, if uh, they didn't have any risk factor and respiratory symptoms, go in, 
Otherwise, they will be directed to the emergency department by dedicated staff. Also, our all entry points had clear signages to uh, direct them to go towards either to the normal um, area in E a non-COVID area or a respiratory or COVID area. So we divided our ED into respiratory zone, COVID and non-respiratory uh, zone. Uh, so from very early at the entry points, both in our primary care setting and in our emergency area, we had a trial just done. Patients, patient area, there was, a, uh, we ensured that uh, there was adequate spacing between patient and the patient area as well. The other important thing what the whole world was facing was inadequate PPE and, and we were no different. But um, fortunately, fortunately for us, we, uh, we were very fortunate to have adequate PPE. And during that time, we had a lot of people donating and coming forward. And, and therefore, uh, uh, we managed to ensure that all our healthcare workers had, had uh, PPE. So to ensure that PPE was not used uh, inappropriately and wastage of PPE and ensuring that the PPE that we got, like N95 masks and goggles and, and other things were as of, uh, of good quality or of the right quality, we had a team that, uh, that ensured that the PPE that we got from donations or we bought uh, was of uh, the proper quality and of proper standards. And we also had a system to track the PPE they were using. We also made sure there was adequate budget and funding available to buy uh, the things that we needed because we needed to get HEPA filters and we needed to uh, put up barriers and, and get more PPE. So uh, we also ensured that lab services were available. There were enough reagents to do our PCR tests, uh, human resources. Uh, so our microbiologists were, were very important in all this. And they were one of the main uh, players in, in ensuring that services went on and the hospital was kept safe. <clears throat> We then uh, went on uh, in early March, went on to cancelling and rescheduling elective surgeries. So only uh, uh, emergency surgeries were done. Uh, we de redeployed staff because a lot of uh, services were shut down. So the staff from uh, services that were, you know, like rehab and, and surgeons were, were deployed to other areas in the hospital, to COVID wards and ED to help out with swabbing, managing patients. We even had orthopedic surgeons in the COVID ward, which was which was very good. Uh, and uh, we had reduction, we also reduced the number of staff and reconstruction of ro rosters. We had decanting of patients to uh, other hospitals, including other university hospitals as well. We limited the number of visitors. So actually no visitors were allowed unless it was absolutely necessary case by case basis. And visiting hours was only once a day. Uh, now we have increased it to two, uh, one visitor per patient. And if you need more, uh, we assess case by case. We cancelled all large meetings, assemblies and events. Healthcare workers were not allowed to travel overseas and they needed to declare if uh, they did travel or they had come in contact with anyone or they had attended any uh, uh, um, gatherings. Medical students uh, were not allowed into the ward during this time. Health communication and risk, because as, as you are aware, the, the guidelines were changing very frequently uh, um, and you know, the definitions were changing very frequently. So all our guidelines were put up in, a, in the portal and was easily accessed to our staff to ensure communication. We had posters up and we also had um, um, experts uh, talking about COVID and place where staff could come and answer, ask questions. So ID physician, microbiologist, uh, SPM, team uh, uh, were there to answer these questions online. We also, to avoid stigma and, and psychosocial, there was also stigma and psychosocial support for both patients and staff. So we had our, our psychologists and psychiatrists involved in this to ensure that uh, you know, uh, staff was, um, was, was adequate support. The other big thing, of course, is ensuring that there was no intra-hospital transmission of COVID and therefore there was a surveillance system put up for both healthcare workers and patients. So uh, this was basically to, to have surveillance on healthcare workers returning from travel, asymptomatic healthcare workers who had history of exposure to a positive case or, or a suspected case, uh, and also um, patients who are as 
exposed to other patients or healthcare workers. We come from COVID, we had a surveillance system going on. So, um, uh, in, in um, these patients, uh, uh, healthcare workers could go online and, and uh, we had um, the OSH uh, occupational uh, health uh, doctors would review this patient and assess them and do a risk assessment. So we ha the, the team had, had um, surveyed or who were under surveillance, our healthcare workers were almost 2,400 healthcare workers were under surveillance. Uh, and, um, and, and through this surveillance, we managed to modify our guidelines to ensure healthcare workers were not uh, infected. So based on, on our initial experience, we were protecting uh, healthcare workers from patients, so ensuring all those things were put into place. But as the, as the epidemiology went on, we noticed that healthcare workers could also transmit the disease to healthcare workers. So we put in very strict infection control measures to prevent this from happening, uh, transmission from healthcare worker to healthcare worker, whereby we said all healthcare workers must wear a, a mask in the hospital, as, but especially in a clinical area, or when they were with each other uh, and they couldn't maintain a physical distance of one meter or were in a confined space. Oh. Frequent hand hygiene was reinforced. There was no more direct contact when greeting people, so no shaking hands or hugging. Uh, also, regular cleaning and disinfectant of high, high touch spaces areas were reinforced. We ensured there was hand rub and uh, wipes available in, at all areas. Uh, healthcare workers no, and disinfectant of uh, places and all patients were supposed to be masked up. Also, uh, pantries, we ensured that there was adequate spacing there. One of the things in our hospital was our prayer rooms uh, where... Uh, things were shared. So to avoid that, we came up with a guideline where in prayer rooms... Were... We also have a nursery and we ensured that the nursery was also adequately uh, surveillance was going on there. Uh, and uh, we had a team to monitor and ensure that um, it was maintained. Uh, Post-COVID, we have come up with a surveillance system for acute respiratory surveillance system. So all REs and, uh, and, um, and all REs are under surveillance to ensure to, so that we can catch patients earlier. Uh, currently, meetings and conferences can go on, but very, with very strict guidelines and they have to undergo uh, some training. Medical students uh, are allowed back in small groups, but they too need to undergo uh, an entry visa. And most of the learning, if it's not bedside, it is done as a, in, on e-learning module. We are also starting telemedicine. Uh, so various departments will soon be uh, uh, consulting, patients be consulted this way. And management plays a big part in ensuring that uh, our uh, we have adequate PPE and human resource, uh, resources available, but more importantly, coming up with more permanent engineering control measures like having more negative pressure rooms available to face for the pandemics. Uh, this is the Ministry of Health website, which also has uh, all the guidelines, uh, has got uh, infographics and the most recent update in the country. And I think it's a very good website for, for people to go and refer to. And this is my last slide. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who was involved in this. Uh, in this. Okay, thank you very much, Sashila. Um, in, in the interest of time, maybe if I if, if there are any questions from our colleagues at Changgung, if not, uh, we might move on. Yeah, uh, to a bit, uh, I think we can leave the Q&A in the later part. We have a safe uh, like 20 minutes uh, for the Q&A. We can wow. come back to that. But I'd like to congratulate to you. Uh, you really do a good job. And, and what you watch, uh, Dr. So Shashila have, have uh, shown us is a very well prepared and, and comprehensive uh, multi-layer uh, uh, task force uh, to, to work on every layer to, to let the uh, uh, infection can be controlled, contained. And, and uh, basically that is what we have been done, doing here. So uh, it's really uh, uh, nice to, to see your uh, your pre, uh, presentation and, and it's a flashback of uh, what we have done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. And I think um, all that was, was instrumental in making sure that we didn't have, um, you know, intra-hospital infections, which, which I think has been part of the problem in places like, like UK and, um, and the US, where uh, unlike your hospital and ours, uh, less attention has been given to intra-hospital infection, which then leads to more infection. So um, our next speaker is uh, Associate, Associate Professor Dr. Lin Shu Min and Dr. Chun Wen Cheng, who will present um, severe cases that were managed at Chang'an Memorial. Over to you. Yes. Hey, sorry, because you're still sharing your PPT, so would you please uh, um, switch course? Can you see our... Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will let uh, Professor Lin do, do his presentation. Okay, okay. Uh, Abdiba, can you see our PPT? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to uh, have a talk here. And I would like to uh, share uh, a case uh, with our experience in, in the hospital. The first I would like to show you is the, the list of our uh, critical COVID-19 patients in our hospital. We actually take care of uh, five uh, patients uh, in, in the ICU. And as you can see the, the, in the slide, there are there were two uh, patients eventually died, and uh, most of them received a uh, mechanical ventilator, and three of uh, the patients received ECMO therapy. And uh, this is uh, an example of a biomarker we usually use in uh, severe COVID-19 patients. And you can see that in the very beginning of uh, the disease, uh, the uh, remarkable lipopenia in this patient, and, uh, as the time goes by, when you uh, recover, you can see the recover of a uh, lymphocyte count, and uh, and the very specially is uh, the the CRP level is, is very consistently with uh, the severity of their illness, and uh, so you can see that when the patient just uh, admitted and uh, they have uh, he have a respiratory failure and even he uh, received ECMO treatment, you can see the peak of the CRP and. Uh, after the, the improvement of uh, her, her condition, you can see that the recovery of the CRP. And the other biomarker you can use is IR6. And, uh, but uh, according to the, the, the condition in Taiwan, only about 50% of the hospital can provide the measurement of IR6. And so if you, your hospital has the, 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 the capacity to measure the IR6, you can use IR6 as a biomarker also. But I'm pretty sure may, may, may that um, almost all the hospitals can measure CRP. So I, I will recommend to use the CRP as a biomarker to follow up the ENE severity of your patient. Next slide, please. And this is the, an example of our uh, patient. This is the patient who, actually, this is the first uh, uh, patient with respiratory failure of COVID-19 in Taiwan. And initially, he, she was a... Uh, diagnosed as a, a community of chronic pneumonia because he, she, uh, she had a, a rapid test of influenza positive and, and, and then he was admitted to the infection uh, work. And, uh, but you can see the, the, the blue line in the, in, the screening, in the screen, you can see the persistent fever no matter how we change the antibiotics. And in uh, February 17, this is the first day the, the, the CDC, Taiwan CDC opened the, the PCR test to uh, the hospital. So the first time we have the PCR test and then we do the PCR test and it turned out to be positive. So the patient was uh, moved to a negative uh, pressure isolation room of ICU. And unfortunately, uh, and the day, uh, next day, due to uh, refractory hypoxemia and uh, CO2 retention, uh, we perform ECMO support for this patient. And, uh, 
and uh, gain uh, the cost of uh, ECMO uh, treatment, it's a very uh, complicated uh, technique. So uh, when the patient was confirmed for the diagnosis of COVID-19, every morning uh, our team member need to have a, a morning meeting to discuss what uh, the procedure we were going to do today because we don't want to let our uh, healthcare worker to stay in the in the isolation room all the day. We need to collect all the things that we are going to do in the day and then we uh, collect them to a short period of time to make sure that our nurse come to the, the isolation room. They can finish all their job in once a, about uh, 30 minutes because when you wear the PPE, you cannot stay in the negative pressure room too long because you will, you will very, uh, feel very hot and severe sweating. And so we, every morning we will uh, have a discussion about the doctor, the nurse, the respiratory therapist, the, the nutrition nutri specialist, and, and the other doctor. And then we will decide what we're going to do today. And then we can make a list and to, to discuss about the nurse, how can we perform our job in the, in the negative isolation room. And then you can see on the third day of ECMO therapy, and the patient started to have an improvement. And uh, on the screen, you can, you can see that the, the tidal volume, we decreased the tidal volume to a very low uh, level because we need to have a complete rest of the lung and the, to wait for the limb to recover. This is a, uh, we call the ultra protective lung strategy in combination with the uh, ECMO. And uh, after eight days of ECMO treatment, uh, we can start to taper the 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 FIL two in the ECMO system and uh, in in and you can see the, the 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 day we try to taper ECMO we try to uh, decrease the airflow to zero and then try to see what happened and the first try we can you can see the the, the retention of a uh, CO two with uh, to uh, sixty three and so we we recover the, the the ECMO system again and then uh, we try to increase the ventilator setting and then follow to repeat the, to return the, to, to, to switch the airflow system in ECMO to zero. And this time we can, we do a good job and then we remove the ECMO on the next day. Next, next. And then we try to do the ventilator wing because uh, this is the negative isolation room. So we cannot, uh, uh, we, we need to be very careful. So uh, we, we try to uh, recover the, the, the tidal volume to for around 400 milliliter. And then we try to see the response of patient. And, and find, we, we found she's doing pretty well. And uh, we try to stop the sedation and then try to check the, 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 the winning profile. As you can see, we have, we have, a, we have done the check the winning profile uh, very, uh, several times because we don't want to uh, uh, have a, the liberation from ventilator failure and then do some repeat the uh, intubation emergently. So we, we need to uh, very, make very sure to make sure the patient with can tolerate uh, her spontaneous breath. So you can see the second episode, we check the, the winning profile, the rapid shallow breathing index is, is good, but the, the, the PI mass is a little bit borderline. So we try to give uh, the patient the CPAP only for two hours and she's doing well. So we uh, put, them, put the patient back to the ventilator and let her has a good, nice sleep. And on the next day, on the next day we try to uh, remove the endotracheal tube. On the day we remove the endotracheal tube, actually on the day we uh, prepare uh, uh, all the team in, uh, in the room because we, we cannot sure whether the patient w w can tolerate uh, the spontaneous breath. So we will we'll prepare for the, if, if the patient cannot tolerate the procedure, he may receive repeated intubation immediately. Uh, fortunately, uh, the patient can tolerate the procedure pretty well. And then we uh, do the, 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 the procedure of extubation. And after extubation, we need to keep all the patient in the room for 30 minutes to, to direct to see the patient if they, the patient can doing very well in the, in the procedure and after 30 minutes everything good all the 
a healthcare worker can uh, leave the room. Next. And so the, we, as we can, we, we know the ARDS may develop in the COVID-19 patient. It's around 20% around of the, the patient with a severe disease. And in facing of the very severe hypoxemia, there are many strategies we can use. For instance, the lung protective strategy, prone position, station, and uh, ECMO. Especially the ECMO is a, is a, is a, a last choice for, for community, I think, because uh, the ECMO itself is a very uh, facility and the manpower consuming procedure. So we need to be care very careful. Not every patient receives ECMO because uh, uh, you, will, you will take many facilities in, uh, uh, in our system. And uh, I think the, the age and the comorbidity were very important to, uh, to the outcome of the patient. And uh, some possible biomarker can help in uh, determining the yearly severity of COVID-19. For instance, the IL-6, CRP, and the lipopenia. And uh, we do need a uh, multidisciplinary teamwork very, very, work very uh, closely together to have a very good communication that can uh, be uh, prevent the, 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 the health worker to get infected and also can do very well to a COVID-19 patient. And uh, I think we need to uh, be prepared in advance to prepare any condition may happen in this uh, novel virus, especially uh, most of the care workers need to wear the PPE and work in a negative isolation environment. So we need to be pre prepared for everything in advance. Uh, thank you. That's my talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. So thank you very much for sharing that uh, detailed uh, management of your of your patient. Um, I will hand over to Dr. Sharifa Farida on our side, and then perhaps we can uh, discuss these cases after Sharifa's presentation. Thank you, Professor, and also thank you to our colleagues in Taiwan for this opportunity. So um, I'm going to show some cases that we had in your MMC who were severe. Um, I'll skip these few slides just to say that um, in total we had just under 9,000 cases in Malaysia and the numbers have gone down since we instituted the MCO. But just to highlight that the majority of cases came uh, were, were in Selangor and Kuala Lumpur where UMMC is situated. So we did get quite a big number of cases. In terms of our hospitals, we had a total of 148 positive cases and six deaths. The number of deaths is much higher than the, the national uh, case fertility ratio, mainly because we had a, a population of geriatric patients who unfortunately succumbed to the disease. So we had our, negative, our, our infectious disease ward where we had 32 beds, but at the peak of the pandemic, we had up to almost 100 beds uh, for our COVID patients. Um, most of the wards, uh, or the beds were all either negative pressure rooms or single isolation. And in terms of who we admitted to the hospital were patients who were under investigation or suspicion for, for COVID-19 and also those who were positive for COVID-19. Um, so in Malaysia, our policy was to admit every single positive case. Uh, therefore, most of the cases in hospital were either asymptomatic or had mild disease. So it was important for us to be able to evaluate and pick out patients who may develop um, severe disease and also to recognize what are the features of severe illnesses. So on top of the WHO and also the Ministry of Health classification, we also had our own classification where we looked for patients who had some, um, uh, you know, more, more moderate to severe respiratory illness, those who were more than 60 years old, and also those who had comorbidity sense of um, monitored them more closely. We also, we were quite fortunate in this, in a sense, because by the time Malaysia had uh, an increased number of cases, which is about early March, middle of March, um, you know, a, a lot was, a lot more was known in terms of patients who develop severe disease and a phenomenon called cytokine storm was uh, starting to emerge and we, we, we learned from that. So we were also looking for patients who had um, symptoms, signs, uh, which suggest a cytokine release syndrome or cytokine storm. 
So patients who were admitted, especially from day five to seven onwards, we were looked, we were looked hard for any signs of clinical deterioration in terms of clinical laboratory and others. And just like uh, what was shown earlier, uh, we were looking hard at reducing lymphocyte counts and also increasing CRP in patients who, who may uh, eventually become more severe. So this is our algorithm of how we manage our patients. So basically those who are symptomatic, looking at those who are mild. Uh, at, at that point, we were still using hydroxychloroquine and Kalitra as our antivirals. Uh, but once we were more confident about the cytokine storm, we were uh, using immunomodulators for patients who showed signs of cytokine storms. Uh, we used tocilizumab. Uh, but also uh, colleagues from around Malaysia were giving, telling us of their experience using uh, steroids, including metoprat and also dexamethasone. So in our hospital, out of the 148 cases, um, based on the WHO criteria, the majority, about 10%, had either stage 4 or stage 5 illness. So pneumonia requiring oxygen or were critically ill. So about, about 15 patients were, were, un, were really unwell. Those who had cytokine storm, so we had 12 patients who actually fulfilled the criteria for cytokine storm, Eight of those were given tocilizumab, and out of the eight, seven were discharged. Unfortunately, one died uh, because he had really advanced and severe disease uh, by the time we gave him the tocilizumab. Um, one patient did not receive tocilizumab because he was one of the earlier patients. We started using tocilizumab at the end of March. Um, but fortunately, this patient, despite not receiving tocilizumab, was, we managed to discharge him. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had a, a population of geriatric patients who unfortunately uh, became infected with COVID-19. And these three patients were already very sick even before the diagnosis, and unfortunately, they died at the end. So these are the first four patients that we had, just a summary of, of them. Um, so as you can see, the majority were, you know, at, at least, the, I think he was the youngest at 48, but the majority was above, were above 50 years old, had comorbidities, they presented around day six to day seven of illness. Uh, at the beginning, they all received hydrochlor uh, hydrochloroquine. Uh, and um, so these eight patients that I'm going to show you now all received tocilizumab. Um, only out of the eight patients, two were intubated. But after a while, we realized that a lot of patients, especially if you catch them early, uh, we can avoid intubation. And subsequently, we were also using high flow nasal cannula oxygen. And uh, six out of the eight patients, we managed to avoid uh, ventilation. Um, the outcome out of the eight, as mentioned earlier, one died, uh, but the others were discharged. So this is the other four patients, again, ages uh, above 50 years old with comorbidities, uh, presenting around the same timeline, except for this one was a bit uh, late, uh, but we still managed to discharge him, and they all received tocilizumab. So just to show a few cases, so this is patient, 48-year-old uh, with hypertension and morbid obesity. So he came in on day seven, uh, already very bad, had to be intubated on arrival. And um, we started him immediately on tocilizumab and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, within a few days, we managed to wean off the inotropes, reduce the ventilator settings, and extubated him, and he was discharged um, just over a week after being admitted and intubated. Um, again, looking at the markers, the lymphocyte count is telling uh, of a possible cytokine storm with a raised CRP in this patient, and you can see the CRP coming down quite nicely at the end of it. Um, this second patient, another 59-year-old, uh, this the gentleman did not have any uh, medical, any other past medical history. He also came in uh, in hypoxic respiratory failure. Uh, he was put on high-flow nasal cannula oxygen, also given uh, tocilizumab together with hydroxychloroquine and Kalitra right from the beginning. And within a week, we managed to wean off the oxygen only to nasal prong oxygen and discharge um, about two weeks after admission. And these are his serial chest x-ray. Again, his uh, absolute lymphocyte count dropped uh, 
quite drastically. CRP was not very high, but we noticed that some patients may not have a very high CRP, uh, though um, you know it, it is quite high compared to other patients. The ferritin, uh, we, do, we don't get real-time ferritin. Uh, get our results within 24, 48 hours, but um, retrospectively, you can see that the ferritin is also elevated. Um, this patient is 60 years old and um, he, he has comorbidities. Uh, again, he was admitted. Uh, so this patient came earlier before we had tocilizumab. So you can see the delay of starting him on tocilizumab. He was put on hydroxychloroquine. Then Kalitra, uh, he had worsened by day seven, but he only got his tocilizumab at day 11 uh, of illness. Uh, so he was started on the 25th of March and within a day, uh, we literally saw him from you know, being at the brink of being getting uh, intubated to sitting on his chair um, and looking very well. So we were, by this time, we were quite convinced that tocilizumab probably uh, is doing something for these patients. Again, the um, absolute neutrophil count was uh, pretty low for this gentleman, and the CRP was and the and the ferritin was also very high. Um, another fifty-five year old gentleman. So this gentleman was a little bit uh, different because, uh, again, we didn't have tocilizumab during this time, but he was uh, clinically deteriorating, admitted to ICU, and we gave him subcutaneous interferon instead. He improved, but, but you know, a few days after that, he was still not uh, completely well. So he still had spiking temperature. We weren't sure exactly what was going on. And later I'll show you his inflammatory markers were still very high. So we decided to give him an uh, IV tocilizumab, even though it was already day 14, because I think the thinking nowadays is to give tocilizumab as soon as you can at the start of the cytokine storm. Um, so we, we gave it, give it to him anyway. And uh, as you can see here, um, his lymphocyte count, despite the interferon, didn't really go up. But then that could also be because of the interferon. Uh, but he recovered together with the uh, clinically, he also recovered. Um, I think, in the interest of time, I won't show you the rest of the cases. I've got another two or three cases. But I think the experience is that uh, we feel that the cytokine storm is a, a major driver for severe disease. And uh, UM, together with other hospitals in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur especially, we've decided to go to, to embark in this uh, randomized control trial because we had colleagues from other hospitals who used uh, prednisolone, um, dexamethasone or metaprednisone with equally good results uh, for the severe cases where patients, um, you know, we managed to avoid them from being intubated and ventilated and the outcome is quite good. Uh, so we've embarked on this. Uh, fortunately, we don't have that many cases now, but if there is a second wave, um, we hope to be able to try these two drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Um so I'm, I'm happy to open the floor to any questions from our colleagues in, in Taiwan or from colleagues here in Malaysia as well. Yes, I, I have a question. I'm uh, curious about the, the when do you decide to use uh, tocilizumab? Because it's an uh, anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibody. And do you measure the level of IL-6 or you use any kind of uh, biomarker to uh, decide to use this uh, monoclonal antibody? Um, unfortunately, we don't have IL-6. So we, we do now for research purposes, but not uh, for, for clinical uh, daily work. So we, we relied heavily on uh, clinical situation basically any drop in saturation even a mild drop we would take that as a clinical indicator and then in terms of uh, biomarkers or laboratory we would look at the um, absolute lymphocyte count and also the crp so even a small jump of crp um, we would consider that as a possible marker for uh, impending cytokine storm and we would start tocilizumab then so it's, it's one dose uh, and usually you will see an improvement within 24 hours. So 
for the clinical trial that we've uh, drawn up, um, the entry criteria that we've chosen, uh, uh, oxygen saturation of 93%, um, I think uh, un unable to maintain oxygen saturation beyond 93% on, uh, on oxygen, on, three, on at least three liters oxygen. Um, and as Farida said, uh, CRP, we've, we've chosen a cutoff point of CRP of 60 um, and, and the usual respiratory rate and temperature. Um, and we now have uh, facilities for IL-6, but at the time in, in early March, when we started using IL-6, uh, I mean, uh, tocizumab, we, we didn't have that facility, um, but but now we will certainly use it as a biomarker for starting um, or randomizing them into tocizumab or um, methylprednisolone. It's interesting that um, when we first drew up this protocol way back in March, uh, I think WHO and others were still not recommending uh, corticosteroids for treatment of severe COVID. So we had a lot of... Uh, um, we, we had to convince our colleagues, uh, certainly our colleagues from Ministry of Health, they were used, some were using it, but um, uh, it took a bit of convincing to actually put it in as uh, the other arm in, in this study. Um, and I wanted to invite colleagues from Singapore as well who were experiencing in these big clusters say, so why don't you try uh, and, you know, use our protocol for your patients. But uh, again, this is early March, uh, late March, early April. They were hesitant uh, because, well, they, they decided not to be a trial site because uh, of the corticosteroid arm. And then, as you, as you know, now dexamethasone is, uh, is a drug of choice until we get something better. No. Uh, it's very great uh, sharing experience and uh, uh, though Malaysia has more cases than Taiwan but uh, from from what you have shared we, we see that uh, you have done a very good job and and really uh, uh, showing a, a very scientific way of uh, proving uh, the effective way of treating this patient I, I think we, we, we do learn a lot from you today uh, I, I don't know if there's any more questions from my colleagues. Uh, we have uh, Professor Ng, uh, the Emergency Department's uh, professor, also our vice president, joining uh, in this meeting uh, later. Uh, later on, uh, is there any, any questions that the professor want to share? No, I just you know, from your emergency department. I think all of uh, our de department and all of our hospitals colleagues have do a great job and uh, already enjoy the showing case and your department, uh, the University of Vegas, uh, the organizing the, uh, the work. So I just hope that we can go through this quite quickly and we hope everyone is very healthy. Thank you. Thank you for the sharing. Thank you very much. Um, I think the, the challenge is going to um, maintain everyone's uh, level of vigilance and uh, discipline in adhering to all the things that we need to do uh, to make sure that you know, we don't have any infections because they, they can come from, from anywhere and before you know it, you have a, a cluster. So that, that to me is the biggest challenge that people don't just yeah. give up and, uh, <laughs> and go back to normal, yeah. all normal. <laughs> Hey, if, if there are no further questions, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Pang and colleagues from Chengeng Memorial. Uh, perhaps, you know, in future we can, um, uh, I'm looking at Dr. Ong there at the other end of the room uh, and, and Dr. Pang, uh, you know, organize more of these webinars because I think there is certainly um, a lot we can learn from each other, not just uh, from, uh, you know, around COVID, of course, but in, in other aspects of clinical care and management. So thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thanks for setting up. <laughs>